Good evening, everyone. We're just... Good evening, everyone. We're just sorting out some technical difficulties and we'll be right with you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for your patience and welcome to this uh, webinar for the Central Godalming Regeneration Project. Um, my name is Councillor Paul Follows, and I'm the leader of Waverley Borough Council, and I'm also the town councillor um, and borough councillor for the central area of Godalming, which includes the town centre. Um, we're going to go through um, a quick introduction of everybody um, here, um, which one of the strategic directors for Waverley, Dawn Hud, will take us through in a moment. Um, and then we'll be doing a short presentation to outline the project, um, what it's doing so far, where we are with the project and, and, and dealing with what we're actually proposing um, in this first stage um, before we move to a, a Q&A. We put the close down at um, 8.15, but we're certainly open to, um, to trying to deal with as many questions as possible throughout this event. The event is going to be recorded um, and posted um, on YouTube at a later date, um, ideally within the next couple of days, so it can be shared around to anybody who wasn't able to attend. And if there are any questions that we aren't able to answer, um, we'll be issuing an FAQs document after we've completed the session to try and catch up on anything else. There'll also be um, email addresses and further contact details if there are any questions um, that, that residents come up with um, afterwards. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Dawn, who's going to take us through um, the initial part of the presentation. Thank you, Paul. Sorry, we're having to share um, some devices tonight, I had some technical issues. So good evening, everybody. Um, most of you will not know me. Um, I'm Dawn Hud. I'm the new Strategic Director of Place for uh, Waverley and Guildford Borough Councils. I'm really pleased to be here tonight. I'm going to chair this session um, and I'm probably going to learn a lot as well because I'm still new girl on the block. So um, we're doing the introductions at the moment um, and then uh, we're going to have a panel presentation. Um, and that will consist of presentations from uh, Paul Follows, the leader of the council, from Council Mark Merriweather, who's the portfolio holder for finance, and from Olivia Jackson, the lead architect for HLM Architects. Uh, we'll then move into a question and answer session. Um, and please, can we ask you to use uh, the Q&A function for your questions? And we will be monitoring those. Um, and trying to group them together so that we can answer them um, in a block. And any questions we don't manage to address tonight will be answered within our follow-up um, FAQs. So um, I'm really glad that you're all here. Uh, we've got a good number of people on the call. Um, and so I think we will um, kick off with letting each person introduce themselves. Paul has already done that. So Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Good evening, everybody. So I'm Councillor Mark Merriweather. I'm the portfolio holder for finance and assets at the council. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. I'm Kelvin Mills. I'm the Head of Commercial Services for Guildford and Waverley Borough Council. And good evening, everyone. I'm Olivia Jackson. I'm an associate at HM Architects and uh, leading on the Godman Central Regeneration Project.
So, Olivia, Olivia do you, you want to just introduce yourself, yourself quickly? quickly? We missed you off there, there, I think. Sorry, that is this my headphones working? I'm afraid we can't hear you, Olivia. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. Got it. Very good. Okay, okay, right. Well, as long as we can get technology to uh, to, to keep up with us, um, just very very quickly, um, I am assuming um, that everybody who's here is um, has already taken a keen interest in what we're doing, um, and uh, I don't want to rehash um, uh, everything because I know that you're um, probably very well informed already. But what what we're about here is is we're we're trying to balance. Uh, we're trying to balance um, the needs of what we need to do here, uh, particularly with the office building um, at, um, at the Berries, uh, which has uh, got to the point really where we are starting to throw very good money after bad um, in a climate where we simply can't afford to do that. Uh, we're falling behind uh, on the maintenance and repair of the building because we don't have the funds uh, to, um, uh, to do that. And particularly uh, now more than ever in, in terms of the current um, uh, energy crisis, the amount it costs uh, to uh, heat this building is, uh, um, is astronomical. Um, the, 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 um, uh, uh, we're balancing that. We're balancing those needs uh, with our strategy. And our strategy isn't just to make money. Our strategy is to uh, benefit um, uh, residents however we can, whether it's housing. Uh, we also have a climate emergency. But we're trying to do all of this within the constraints that we face um, in terms of uh, our, our financing. And the way our financing is structured as a local authority, uh, we have to operate within uh, a financial framework that is um, very, very different uh, to, uh, to the private sector and particularly in, in this case governs what we can and can't do with revenue funds uh, compared to what we can and can't do most importantly with uh, capital funds. Uh, do you want to turn the page? Thank okay. you. Where we are in this project is um, we have um, got to the process where we've got to the stage of the process where we have um, eliminated uh, the least likely candidates uh, and concepts uh, that we think uh, we can deliver. deliver. Uh, and we're engaging on uh, concepts and options. Um, we haven't chosen any yet. We haven't decided on anything yet. These are in principle uh, ideas uh, that are uh, we think are the most likely to be able to solve uh, what we need solving and provide uh, the benefits uh, that we seek. Just to give you an idea, um, in the run-up to this, um, we've looked at uh, dozens of concepts uh, over two phases. Uh, we've eliminated obvious things like um, building on the Berries Field. Uh, we've eliminated selling the land to private developers, uh, but we have insisted on retaining uh, the same number of Waverley public car parking spaces, and we have insisted on making uh, whatever outcome we come up with uh, environmentally as well as uh, financially sustainable. Uh, and we are uh, aspiring to uh, uh, a solution if there are any homes to be built, that those homes will not be sold. They will continue to be owned by us uh, and rented out to, um, uh, to residents who need it most. So dozens of concepts, uh, hundreds of permutations uh, has brought us to this point where we are uh, ready to uh, engage with residents. Uh, this is the first phase of engagement. We're, we are uh, likely to have at least one more uh, round of engagement before we even go uh, into the formal consultation phase uh, and, um, and even then into planning, which of course will be another opportunity if we even get there for residents uh, to comment. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just a summary of the key pro project objectives. Obviously, uh, we, we have to be uh, financially responsible. So we are looking at financial st sustainability. Whatever we come up with will be at no cost to the taxpayer. Um, and in fact, um, should provide some uh, upside as well. Um, we are looking to make a positive impact on the town centre. Uh, we uh, are looking to uh, deliver genuinely uh, affordable and sustainable housing. 
uh, that's not in line with the um, the government regs. It's our own um, definition of affordable. Environmental sustainability is extremely important. This building uh, generates, for example, over 250,000 kilograms of CO2 per year, and we can do a lot better than that. Um, no loss of public car parking. Uh, and uh, obviously addressing the other failures uh, of this building, which is uh, also um, way too big for what we need uh, at the moment. Okay, so that's it very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna hand over to um, uh, Olivia, if we can hear her just to run through the uh, some of the slides on the sites. Thank you. Hi, is this, is this working microphone wise? I'm sorry, can anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, as many of you will be aware, um, this project contains three main sites. Um, the Crown Court car park, uh, the Berries, which is the current uh, offices for the council, uh, and Wharf Road. Um, this project will also consider uh, some of the connectivity and uh, sort of public realm improvements that can, can be brought forwards from this project to do with the high street and to do with connecting these sites. Um, it is, however, really important to note that the Berries field is not within the scope in this project um, and the council are committed to retaining that as public open space. Um, so the sites that you see there with the red line around them, they are the only ones that are under consideration within this project. Next slide. And uh, so the Berries, unfortunately, is quite a constrained site. Um, the presence of the, the flood zone from the River Way within this site uh, make it very hard for us to consider any housing led development on here. Um, it is something that was that was brought forward in the initial testing um, and something that we met with with quite significant challenges with when we talked to the planning authority and when we uh, discussed it with with other um, uh, sort of council um, authorities and departments. Um, so this is not something that hasn't been tested. It's something that we have considered quite substantially. Um, other considerations that have been tested, uh, we've looked at hotel use. Um, we've also looked at um, the retrofit of the space to provide much more fit for purpose workspace. Um, and we've also looked at additional parking um, to help to uh, balance out some of the, um, the, the parking challenges across the town, town centre. Um, we know that the community facilities and the heritage facade of the Berries are of you know, significant importance within the town centre. Um, and those are elements that will be brought forwards um, in any, any proposal uh, moving forwards. Um, but for now, the, the solution that will be that will progress as we move forwards is the workspace um, and, and the retrofit of the building uh, for um, the council and for, for other uses. Um, it is important to note that a retrofit solution is also an incredibly sustainable solution. So something that we are um, pleased to support uh, in terms of looking at the climate agenda. Um, next slide, please. Um, Crown Court offers the opportunity really to uh, allow the council to deliver on some of their promises um, to create genuinely affordable, sustainable housing. Um, now we know that the, the car parking is a really important feature of this site and the council have looked at various uh, different solutions. Uh, they've ruled out the possibility of high density housing um, because you know, apartment led schemes just wouldn't be in keeping with the, with the local area. Um, we've also ruled out the, 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 any solutions that wouldn't retain public car parking on Crown Court. Um, and the council have committed to retaining a third of the, of the public car parking um, on this site, uh, in addition to any homes that they, they bring forwards. Um, the project will consider um, the connectivity to, um, to the high street um, and the connectivity through to the berries. However, it is very important to note that the, the Crown Court itself and the archway is not a part of the, the consideration that the, the only thing that will be looked at there is improvements to the public realm, um, but nothing further than that. Um, it's very important that this site borders onto the conservation area, and that's something that we will be extremely um, aware of and conscious of as we move forwards. 
Um, in addition to that, the views through to the various field are also a very important consideration. Next slide, please. Um, Wolf Road is a much smaller site, as you can see, um, and it has the potential to support uh, an apartment-led high-density housing scheme um, with some retained public car parking. Um, the, some of the key considerations moving forwards will be uh, it, the impact on some of the apartments and homes uh, to the west and the south, um, and also the impact on the uh, nursery um, to the east. Um, other potential advantages that can be brought forward is improving some of the connectivity issues to this side of the road from the town centre. So that's something that will be considered as we move forwards. Pass over to Paul now. Thank you, Olivia. This is just to give everybody a flavour of the entire scheme. Um, again, I'll just reiterate that uh, the little bullet point under the, at the bottom there, that this is an artist's impression. So when we get um, further into the detail of this further out through the, through the project, we'll be looking at specifically what the design and layout of schemes might look like. Um, I've met with residents on them. Um, uh, just off of the Crown Court car park itself about the particular design that's indicated in that artist's impression. And obviously these things are just an artist impression. So the overall project, we'd be looking at approximately 16, uh, 12 to 16 apartments um, with parking at Wolf Road um, with some public overflow parking and better access to uh, the nursery that's next to it and also to the town centre um, across through by Waitrose. The Crown Court itself, we're looking at approximately 20 homes also with parking for those residents and at least one third of the existing public parking spaces retained. Um, I think the thing I just want to add there is at the moment, these are parking spaces that are small. Um, they are an old standard of, of car parking space and size. Some of the, the feedback I've had from um, from residents throughout my time as a councillor is that this needs to be um, bigger spaces uh, and a more diverse type of spaces, particularly parent and child and disabled spaces. There'd also be access to the Wilfred Noyce um, and the Berries and the High Street improved through the scheme here. And then for the Berries itself, the council office site, obviously we've been maintaining the council building refit so that its energy issues and sustainability issues were dealt with. That would be a new fit for purpose and energy efficient space for the council mm -hmm. and also those who work in the council with us. So the police, the Denningberg Centre and others that use the building too. And we'd also try and get a cafe and other community uses into the building as well in some of the spare capacity that the building would have. And then we would have this high quality compact decked car park, um, which would have direct access to Bridge Street. And this would be approximately 105 metres from where the Crown Court car park is now on the site um, adjacent to the council office. You can see uh, the, the back of where that's proposed at the back of the, the council office building. Um, the, the artist's impression there is a little bit uh, difficult to, to, to get your head round because it looks like it's got trees on the top. Um, our intention there would be to, to try and ensure that from the side that you're looking at um, on the Phillips Memorial Park, that this would be as green and as, um, as screened as possible. Um, and the actual structure itself would not be higher than the council office. We'd be thinking something in the order of three decks for this. Um, and again, the purpose of this would be to have spaces that are fit for purpose for, for the 21st century rather than for the, for the mid 60s as, as really what the space is in Crown Court car park are now. I shall be handing over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so just to clarify our commitment so far on, on parking, you know, we are we are keen. Thank you, Mark. Um, so what we've committed to from the outset is one of our key critical success factors was no loss of public car parking spaces within Godalming. All, all the housing that's been spoken about as potential housing will have its own dedicated parking spaces in line with policy. And we're always looking to maintain a significant amount of spaces within Crown Court with any of the options and certainly the artistic impression 
you saw earlier and when Paul was talking showed circa 100, 100 spaces within Crown Court maintained. And just for clarity, any decking parking solution to cover any loss of potential car parking spaces in Crown Court will be dealt with in a sympathetic way to, in keeping with the, um, the situation in which the car park will be found. So we're looking to try and increase both access to both ends of the high street to try and increase footfall, and that's the objective, and all of it will encourage sustainable parking infrastructure for the Godalming visitors. So I will now pass you over to Mark. Uh, thanks, Calvin. So on uh, uh, just on the commitments on finance, clearly finance is, is an important uh, part of this uh, project, but it is not the only part of the project. But from a financial angle, um, our, our, our baseline is that uh, what we're doing is supposed to be at least for our financial benefit. So there will be no cost to Waverley taxpayers uh, and there will be a potential upside uh, to it as well. We are not allowed to actually do things just to make money. Uh, we, uh, we are allowed to make money, but we're not allowed to um, uh, do anything where that's the prime uh, motivation. Um, we're only working on options uh, which have the potential to be financially viable. They also have to be uh, viable from a planning point of view. Uh, I've seen in the uh, Q&A a question about the options that have been discounted uh, or eliminated. Um, uh, dozens of concepts uh, uh, and dozens more of permutations have been ruled out because they are um, they didn't um, uh, uh, look to be uh, financially viable, uh, planning viable. Olivia talked about that earlier on, um, or uh, crossed some of our other um, critical success factors. Um, but at the moment, uh, we are uh, 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 we are looking at projects that um, appear to be the most likely to be financially viable. Um, and we have built in principle models uh, of, um, of what the finances look like. Um, as we go into the next stage uh, in this step-by-step um, -step process, uh, we'll be um, uh, testing that, building out the, um, uh, the numbers in a lot more detail uh, so that we will have uh, a lot more um, uh, uh, certainty over the uh, finances. But I have to say, um, in the current climate, um, that is looking to be something that's going to be extremely challenging as costs uh, and inflation and other supply chain issues uh, kick in. Um, it's, that is going to be a, a, a one of the more difficult uh, elements of this uh, particular uh, project. Uh, I'll hand back over to Paul. Hi, everyone. I'm just talking about housing. I just want to double check that you can hear me through this one. Thank you. Um, so in the terms of the types of housing, and one of the one of the main questions that we've had from residents is the sort of type of housing. Um, and um, and, um, and um, we need to ensure that the, the type of housing that we have is is compatible with the needs of the area, but it's also making sure um, that that we build the type of housing that will generate revenue for the council. And an earlier question that came up this evening when we were speaking to the Chamber of Commerce um, was whether we were going to sell the land or, or or act effectively like a developer. And it's not the intention of the council to sell these houses to to private developers. It's actually most of the intention um, to rent. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in a moment, but we're not intending here to make large capital sums as a council. What we're actually wanting um, is a stable revenue stream that helps the council finances. And that means we can act slightly differently. We're not really building houses um, to make a quick profit, to make a capital injection to the council. We want to build sustainable homes that meet our other objectives as well as um, in generating revenue for the council. Um, so that's reducing the carbon footprint. Um, and there's a good reason why we're doing that. Um, there's two good reasons. One is the environment and reducing the council's overall impact on the climate. And the second one, particularly relevant now, we're in a cost of living crisis with energy bills going through the roof, um, is to reduce costs for the residents that live in those houses. We're also committed to making sure, because the town centre um, is a conservation area, is to making sure that the houses are in keeping with the area that they're in, in the town centre. But we also, as I said, want to keep them affordable houses owned by the council. Now, the mix of these houses is something that we're going to have to talk about um, later because the, the way the economy is at the moment, it is difficult for us to assess the mix at the moment completely. But the intention of this project is to have houses that are owned by the council. And I would really like to see some of those as social housing and some of those as housing that is rented out by the council, um, effectively like a private landlord. 
And the funding for this will provide infrastructure improvements as part of it. And um, there's been at least a couple of comments in the Q&A so far that, that we'll address a bit more um, deeply uh, a little bit later on about the mobility and access between things like the, the pros deck car park and the rest of the high street. So we'll be needing to look at um, the, the connectivity within the town. So at the moment, it's about 105 metres between um, the berries where this proposed car park would be and Crown Court. And we've been wanting to make sure that there's improved access right the way throughout the scheme. We can go to the next slide. I think that's also me. And so the high street. So um, one of my other hats is leader of Gromming Town Council and the councillor for the high street. So um, we want to make sure um, that we have a, a more welcoming frontage um, to the borough council, both sides at the moment. I mean, the front of it at the moment on one side is not particularly welcoming, but we also want to maintain um, the frontage of the borough hall. Um, one of the main comments we've had is that that, that asset is, uh, is, is something that the town wants to maintain, it's certainly something the town council wants to maintain. So we've committed to doing that here. We also want to make sure that people can get through from the berry. Better? Is it working? Thank you. Um, the, the access is better and can be uh, improved. As I've mentioned, that some of that is the connection between the berries and the Crown Court area that we have now. Um, but actually, really, what we want to also start looking at is the Crown Court itself and making sure that is a more appropriate public space um, for the centre of Godalming and a more welcoming space for people who arrive in the town. The, the Borough Council building itself, as well as the housing, do contribute to daily footfall and do support local businesses. Um, we, one of the discussions we had with the Chamber of Commerce earlier this evening was, was, was quantifying exactly how much support that, that contributes, and that's something that we're going to look at with them. Uh, we also want to work with them to um, try and make sure that any footfall that is generated in that part of the town actually is fed through into the high street area and the retail and commercial areas of the town. And that's something that I've committed to, to working with them um, more fully tonight. Um, and just to reiterate again that the berries field itself is completely out of scope. It will remain an open green space. Um, it's actually the intention of both the borough council and the town council to try and make better use of this for events that bring people into the town. Um, certainly the town show and Surrey Pride and some of the other fantastic events we've had in the town. We could be doing more of that and bringing in more business and footfall into the town um, along with it. I think who's next? Thank you. Thank you. To Dawn. So in conclusion, uh, we've whizzed through that and we've given you a lot of information. Um, you have been putting a lot of questions um, into the Q&A, which is fabulous. Thank you. So uh, the conclusion is that we have to do something now. We can't continue to spend half a million pounds a year uh, on uh, the, the berries. So we have to act now. We, we cannot afford to carry on doing that. Um, this will be cost neutral, so no cost to the ta council taxpayer. Um, there will be no loss of car parking in Godalming. I think that's really important because it's one of the biggest issues that's been raised, but there will be no overall net loss of public car parking in Godalming. At least a third of the current car parking will be retained at Crown Court site. Um, this will have a positive impact on Godalming and the High Street in terms of bringing more people into the town centre. Um, and we will be providing genuinely affordable housing provision, um, which I've noticed in the comments, a few people have asked about that. Um, and we will also be meeting our own environmental sustainability standards that we're setting now through our planning policy um, and our local plan. So that's, a, as I say, a whistle stop tour. That's the conclusion of what we've shared with you this evening. Um, and we will move into the Q&A session. Um, we have quite a number of questions that have been posed. We'll try and um, clump them together and answer them um, uh, two or three at a time. So I'm going to hand back to uh, Paul, who's going to take the first set. Thank yeah. you, Paul. Thank you, Dawn. Um, so we've got, um, please um, just to encourage everybody to start submitting more questions through the Q&A and we'll, we'll obviously go through them and try and address them. And we'll, uh, Dawn and I will divvy them up to the most appropriate person in the room um, with certainly with working technology to make sure that people get an answer. Um, so I'm just going to go through these in the order that they received. Um, there'll be a few of these that may need some follow up afterwards. So will we be dis um, sharing what the discounted options were? And I'm going to hand over to Mark Merriweather to address that question. Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, in actual fact, uh, um, Olivia's uh, already uh, touched on some of them. They, they've been uh, options have been eliminated um, and discounted based on their performance against our critical success factors. So, so options that uh, would never have stood a chance with planning, 
uh, have been uh, eliminated, and also options that uh, were really non-starters from a financial uh, standpoint have been eliminated. And if I can just give you a flavour of that, um, as a local council, you know we're we're in a funny position where um, we can't sell an asset and use the proceeds to fund our our general services. So uh, uh, we can't sell a plot of land and use that money for repairs to a building. We can use that money for a new building. We can uh, use it for all sorts of other uh, capital pro projects, but we can't use it for uh, run-of-the-mill revenue expenditure. So those things, um, those things have been eliminated. Um, there are lots of there are lots of them, um, and um, probably too many to share. But uh, it, from relocating the offices, renting new offices, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, options and permutations have been considered. Um, if anybody uh, uh, um, thinks that they have a concept or an option that we haven't considered, I encourage them to um, uh, to uh, 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 put it forward. Um, you know, we are still uh, at a stage where, um, you know, we are very um, grateful for constructive uh, ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, there's been a number of questions referencing the um, the collaboration between Waverley Borough Council and Guildford Borough Council, um, particularly about the uh, whether we whether we have considered uh, using the Guildford building or bringing Guildford people here or some arrangement that would that would work there. And I'm going to just bring in my colleague Dawn from who is now a, a joint director of Guildford and Waverley, who was formerly of, of just Guildford. Thank you, Paul. Um, so um, really good question. And as you might imagine, uh, both councils are looking at their uh, their head offices um, during COVID. Um, we've uh, mostly worked to move to flexible working practices, agile working as most businesses have. And so we are all reassessing what, what we need going forward. Um, and we are having discussions between the two councils about how that might look in the future. Um, Guildford uh, Council has got its own uh, head office at um at Millmead and it's way too big for purpose and that site is also part of the Guildford Town Centre regeneration um, programme and master plan that's emerging. So yes, the answer is that we are looking at this, it's nothing that's going to happen tomorrow and whether or not we co-locate in the long term in in Waverley or um, at Godalmin or in Guildford um, is, is something that will not be determined in the next uh, couple of years. Um, but either way, we will still need to redevelop the very site because it is in a floodplain. It can't be used for housing, so it needs a commercial use. Um, and whether the council is is in this building uh, long term or not, we still have to get on with doing this work um, and fund it so that it is commercially viable. Um, because if the council moves somewhere else, it's got to pay rent. Um, so that comes back to the point that um, Mark made earlier about the difference between capital and revenue income. Thank you. And Mark's just going to take a little bit more through that, I think, Mark. Yeah, uh, just to add, um, we, we've we've talked to uh, we've talked with Guildford, um, we've talked with other um, uh, uh, partners uh, in in the area. We've looked at um, the feasibility of um, moving from this site and going renting somewhere else. Um, the reason uh, the, the reason that we come back to refurbishing the berries um, is because it's a site that we do already own, and in refurbishing it, we can make the space uh, flexible enough for us to adapt to those sort of future uh, decisions. So we we will we will future proof uh, whatever it is we do here um, in the berries. Uh, we need to accommodate all of our current um, tenants, the police and Surrey County Council. Uh, and um, we may have space to attract new tenants to generate even more revenue. Uh, the, um, but the, uh, the essence is that um, part of this project, part of the upside is to um, change the nature of the space to be flexible so that we have uh, all of those uh, opportunities open to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, some uh, another batch of questions we've had relate to the actual state of this building um, and why we need to actually make changes to it, and effectively why it's causing the sorts of costs. I'm going to hand over to Kelvin Mills just to talk us through that. But one thing I just wanted to say say first um, was that 
the issues with the building such as they are are now much more significant because of the energy uh, costs that we're seeing generally in the country so what was and still is a problem is is an escalating problem that's getting worse uh, i'm now going to hand over to, to mark actually first thank you mark yeah, I, I, I might need to hand over to Kelvin, no. but the but <laughs> but there are um, the problems with this building really are twofold, um, and I and I'm specifically going to talk about the, the the 1970s part of this building rather than the more historic elements like Borough Hall, which are which are not going to be um, uh, affected. Uh, it's a 1970s building; it it, it doesn't have uh, all of the insulation or any of the um, uh, uh, the features that one would expect in a modern fit for purpose building. Um, and because uh, we don't have revenue funding to spend um, on the repairs here, uh, for years it's been falling further and further behind uh, in its general repairs and maintenance as it slowly started to um, deteriorate and degrade as these buildings do. So at the moment, um, our facilities uh, team keep track uh, of where we are in terms of uh, repairs and maintenance, and we uh, uh, and we're told um, that we have probably about three million pounds worth of, um, uh, 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 of repairs and maintenance that need doing, whether it's the boilers, whether it's the roof. Um, there's a whole list of things. Um, and that um, breaks down to around about 300,000 pounds a year if we want to try and keep this building alive for 10 years. Now, of course, that the question then is, are we throwing good money after bad because we'll still be back where we were, uh, where we are in 10 years time, um, having thrown even more money at it because stuff still falls uh, falls off the building uh, every day. Um, the other issue is that we are, uh, we, we think that we need to spend 300,000 pounds a year on maintaining the building and we don't actually have the revenue even to do that. Um, so every year we're falling further and further behind um, simply because we don't have the uh, funding to keep up. Now, um, that's one side of it. The other side of it is, of course, it's an inefficient building. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, the, the money that we spend on energy um, kind of goes up in smoke. And with our energy bills now, um, at least three heading to four times uh, what they were um, not that long ago, um, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of pounds, two, three hundred thousand pounds a year, um, just to try and heat the building. Uh, in many cases, without even successfully uh, heating the building. So, if you wrap all of that together, we're talking about um, you know the opportunity to cut our costs by five or six hundred thousand um, pounds, which um, for us is a significant amount of money. It is five percent of the council tax that we collect from our residents, um, it would be uh, wrong of us not to do anything about that. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of uh, the questions that have come in on, on very specific matters, which hopefully I can answer. Um, so there's a, a number of questions about, um, are there any plans to pedestrianise the high street as part of the scheme? Um, so we're only talking about assets that Waverley own in this equation, but there's a couple of points that a number of residents have raised at the engagement events I, I wanted to pick up on as part of this. So Waverley doesn't own all the shops in the high street and nor does the town council. So we don't get to set the rents um, or, or really do have, have any control over over who is in those shops um unless we actually own the property like for example um with 69 high street the former m and co we, we bought and, a, and we'll have a tenant in fairly soon um in terms of the pedestrianization the roads are actually managed by surrey county council um residents of godwin will know that during the pandemic that we we did attempt to sort of uh, demo pedestrianization throughout the town um in order to see whether uh, there would be calamity because it's obviously been um, discussed many many times over the last um 30 years effectively um and we did find that the bollard was was a was a huge issue and anybody who lives here and has tried to drive through the town during the pandemic probably had an issue with that bollard at some point so we've we've been asking the town council have been asking um surrey to consider some alternative schemes um, for pedestrianization and when they've given us some kind of indication as to uh, whether they would in principle be okay with that um that's something that the town council along with surrey is gonna uh, is gonna consult on separately what i think this scheme needs to look at 
though, is actually physically connecting people um, to the public transport and also to the car parks. So where this scheme does um, need to get involved is, is the accessibility and the type of routes between it. So, for example, um, I would envisage that the path that currently connects the council offices to Crown Court that then goes up through the Crown Court itself um, would need to be significantly improved um, and the actual access to the town would need to be improved as part of the scheme. But the pedestrianisation itself is separate. Yeah. Oh, sorry, just get uh, log into some of the rest of the questions. Um, I'm also just now going to pick up a couple of um, the, the questions on housing. So Mr. Shirley and Mr. Ashworth and Councillor Ashworth um, particularly have been asking about um, the types of mix of housing. Um, so um, Richard, in terms of the, the type of housing, it would certainly be my hope that the majority, that as much as possible, um, is either social housing or affordably uh, priced rental accommodation through the council as a landlord. Um, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the actual number and type and mix of the housing is something that we're going to have to discuss um, as as the economy uh, really is a bit of a problem in terms of costing this at the moment. So that is something we're going to go into more details on. But the objective of the, of the council is to make these as affordable, genuinely affordable as possible. The government term affordable housing generally relates to about 80% market rent or rate of uh, market purchase. This is a bit of a nonsense when you're talking about Waverley. So we're trying to break that cycle. Um, and in answer to Mr. Shirley's question, the, the by the council retaining all of the land, because we need the revenue from it, but that's why we're not intending to sell it. We're also allowed to then apply our allocation policies and our allocation policies give a primacy to wait the waiting list in the social housing register and also a number of other qualifications um, regarding connections to the area. Um, so it wouldn't just be a case of it could be swallowed up necessarily on the open market. We would be allowed to apply our allocation policies to it. And that's something that we would intend to do throughout a lot of this. Okay. Um, Liv, I think you want to come in. Hi, yeah, if I could just um, elaborate on the um, the high street question as well and some of the opportunities there within the sites that that are within the council's ownership. Um, there is a big potential and there's, there's a lot of um, uh, th th there's a lot of projects going around at the moment that are, are to do with um, a different type of high street, bringing community functions as much more of a sort of to the fore on high streets um, and not relying on the retail model that we used to have that is currently failing because of some of the online uh, presence that we had. But, you know, by virtue of that, um, some of the, the advantages of looking to, to really cement the, the council presence, uh, the, the idea of a cafe, the idea of some workspace that can come in there um, that can be used by local businesses um, is looking at a way of reanimating the high street and providing an alternative to some of the retail space. Um, likewise, looking at, um, at housing kind of within the town centre is again increasing that footfall and just allowing um, further footfall to, footfall to to support local businesses and really see that as a place where they sort of live, work and play. Um, and I think, you know, the triangulation before, between these different developments actually has the potential to create a different type of high street and something that actually drives quite consistent footfall throughout. Thank you, Olivia. Um, I'm just going to address a couple of the questions about car parking before I address some more. Well, Mark will probably address some more about the actual funding and the finances of this. Um, and um, in the first instance, regarding the car parking data, um, so there was a previous statement that the executive, of which I'm the chair here, made um, some in our debates in 2021 about the need for significant extra parking to, to support a robust high street. Um, this is a, a question put forward by Timothy Miggins. Um, in terms of the actual parking, we, we've agreed this evening to share the, um, the utilisation of the car parks data, um, because one of the things that I see all the time is that people make assumptions that the car parks are always full based on their experience and certainly as somebody who's used those car parks in Godalming I can see why people would come to those conclusions um, well, we're going to share the actual parking data and broadly the only overutilized so more than 100% use utilization car park ends up being queen street um, and that's because um, people usually pay for more time than they actually use and so there's more people there um, so a lot of this is perception rather than um, rather than anything based up by any actual data Part of this scheme is to not just maintain the current parking level, but also to provide better types of parking. So wider car parking spaces at modern standards, 
more disability spaces um, and, and better access for, say, parent and child spaces. So the types of spaces are actually nearly as important as the as the actual overall number of spaces. It is also about connecting um, the different active transport uh, ways uh, methods together. So, for example, people using the buses, the trains, and actually people walking from other parts of Godalming and other parts of the high street and town centre area into the retail and commercial areas. So it's it's a little bit more um, complex than just the, the the amount of parking in terms of spaces. It's it's a lot more than that. Um, you and I, Timothy, have, have spoken quite a lot on this subject, and I'm very happy to to continue on it. Um, as we mentioned at the end of this session, we we have another um, another live session at the uh, 69 High Street at the weekend, and I'm very happy to pick that up with you there if you're about. Um, I've got another question uh, that Mark is going to pick up um, from Daniel regarding um, how we're effectively paying for this, how long it would take to pay back. So I'll hand over to you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Paul. There we go. Um, I'll, 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 do a, I'll do a couple of these. So um, uh, the um, in, in terms of the funding, so so the, uh, the funding framework for this is that we... Um, uh, spend capital, uh, we invest in capital, uh, and that is in in return for uh, net revenues that will come in from the project. So uh, those revenues will not only be the rental uh, that come in from new homes, but it'll also be the cost savings uh, that uh, we achieve through cutting um, our, uh, our, our maintenance and repairs and also our energy costs. For the new building, so the critical uh, the test here will be at the end of uh, at the end of this um, uh, of this process will be will the net revenues that are coming in recurring revenues uh, pay for the uh, repayment and servicing uh, of the uh, cost of capital for actually building the project? Now uh, we've been modelling this out um, as best we can based on the in principle ideas. Um, before we do that, we are having this engagement before we um, uh, uh, define uh, what we want to take forward uh, to um, to actually do all of the detailed, uh, the, the more detailed homework that I think, um, Daniel, that you're um, that you're looking for now. So um, the the, uh, the 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 engagement at the moment is on the in principle notions of. Uh, what we want to do, uh, and um, whatever it is uh, that goes forward to engaging to 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 the next phase, will be what we invest the money in in actually doing the detail modelling, um, financial and otherwise. Um, I've got a couple of other questions actually. Um, there's one. Um, there's one about Thurrock. Um, I, I I know that's not necessarily. We're going to address um, Thurrock in the chat. Um, I, I, I'm not, it's, it's not really one for this evening. Um, you know, uh, one of the um, one of the quirks, uh, if I could put it like that, of local government um, finance is that from a treasury standpoint, we're only allowed to in uh, to put money on deposit to the extent that we have any cash. Uh, uh, we have to put it on deposit uh, with uh, AAA rated. Um, uh, institutions and local government, uh, including Thurrock, uh, is AAA rated. Um, uh, we we um, we will get that back. It's government guaranteed. Um, uh, uh, we uh, our our in, uh, 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 investment in Thurrock um, was um, uh, the smallest, if not one of the smallest, uh, that uh, that they had on their books, and it is not going to impact us. Um, there was otherwise there was a question um, from somebody asking about uh, uh, quoting some numbers, some historic numbers for our gas and our uh, for our gas. Um, and um, it, it, it's kind of right. I, I, I don't I don't um, uh, have the numbers to hand. But yes, um, up until the start of the energy crisis, um, our uh, gas and electricity bills were in low three figures, uh, 100,000, maybe a little bit more. Um, those numbers, as we sit here today, have tripled uh, and are and are heading north. And, and that is why I said uh, we can no longer just do nothing. Uh, we have to um, uh, um, bite the bullet. As far as uh, I also saw someone saying, why do we have to spend a million pounds now 
to uh, take it to to understand the financial uh, viability of this. Um, yeah, I've just found it. It's uh, Mr. Clark. Um, I don't recognise the million pounds. Um, we uh, we at the moment at the phase that we're in um, has a budget set of one hundred and sixty four thousand uh, pounds, of which we spent just under six thousand uh, pounds, and and that uh, and that budget is for precisely for this engagement, for digesting this engagement. Uh, and for um, doing all of the detailed homework and due diligence uh, that um, you would expect us to do in coming forward with um, more detailed proposals. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to pick up a couple of the other questions in here. Um, Janet Crow is asking about people picking up from Moss Lane School. Um, so the intention would be that we would allow um, all of those with 15 minute permits to still do that. And we've actually had some direct engagement with Moss Lane on, on the subject of this. One of the things we've just been talking to the Chamber of Commerce about um, is actually in people who work in the town centre, um, many of which are actually coming from outside Godalming, not being able to afford to actually park in the car parks for the whole day and that impacting employment and businesses. Um, so we've committed to having a discussion, um, certainly with them and others, about some form of subsidised parking scheme. We're also looking into a business improvement district um, for, for various areas in Waverley, which would allow us potentially to, to, to do that sort of subsidised parking option for, for people who work in the town centre. And I would certainly include um, Moss Lane and other areas like that, where there is a need to access it and a need to park for very short periods of time, basically to pick up your kids or drop them off. Um, and we need to make sure that that, that sort of thing is still um, still possible. There's also um, a discussion that I've had with the Great George Street residents, not just about the the, the dis potential designs, because obviously the, the one that's in the artist's impression, I think, uh, quite reasonably uh, freaked out the residents of Great George Street, for lack of better words. I, I, I completely understand why it did. Um, but also a discussion with residents there about putting in some kind of parking permits for them as well, because historically they've not really had any access to that. And it's a it's a proper debate that needs to be had um, and sorted out with them. Um, there's a couple of other ones here and probably we'll end up bringing on Mark for this. Um, certainly one of these I'll answer. What provision of borough social housing is built into the developments along Cashel Lane, the Aarons Hill and Milford Secrets developments? Um, this is one of those areas where... I think it, most residents quite reasonably, and I, I was like this before I became a councillor, assume that all developments, because they've got planning permission from the council, are in some way council developments and that we have some kind of control. Um, nearly all development that you see um, is private developers and they have to seek planning permission um, from the planning authority, which is Waverley Borough Council. And we have to follow national planning policy set by the government. And if we throw things out just because we don't like them, often they win on appeal and sometimes we get costs awarded against us if we do that. So it's not something that we can take um, as flippantly as, as perhaps some of us would, would like to do. And it means that we can't just say no to everything because also the government set housing targets for an area and they set those targets against the borough council, despite the fact that it's actually not us building most of the housing. And at the moment, developers aren't building most of their housing that they've been permitted to do either because of the various cost of living um, and economic issues. So, Mr. Miggins, you've asked about um, social housing being built into those developments. Well, the government planning policy at the moment says about affordable housing. And so our local plan um, has, has said that um, they need to put 30 to 40 percent of affordable housing. Now, that's the government definition of affordable housing, which I, I personally think is a bit of a joke. But at the same time, that is what the only thing we're allowed to mandate. And um, there are lots of ways that they managed to get out of that, too. But it's certainly the target that we we set for them. But in terms of the provision of, of, of social housing I'm directly owned by the council, there's no provision of that in any of those sorts of developments. And there's no way we can force the issue unless we buy large tracts of those private development at very significant costs. The reason I've gone into that question is because I just want to make the point that there is lots of housing going on in Waverley, but these are not housing developments that the council makes any money off of, even though we are often the planning authority that has had to approve them because the government has set those targets. So it's it's just to reiterate that we we don't make money off of all of these properties it's not something that we can we can get it um, it would be like me saying um i i want to build um on your house and or, or just use your house we don't own these things we we can't benefit from them in any way um there's a question mark i think really this one's probably more for you um why we call this a regen project um <laughs> all right um 
Okay, so uh, just uh, I was actually going to ask answer another one, which I'll just get out of the way, and then that 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 will come. Uh, Denningberg, all of the other, all of all of our ter tenants uh, will be um, uh, will be retained. They'll be reprovided for uh, uh, the Surrey County Council, the police, um, everybody, um, if they uh, if they want to be. So uh, yeah, so so um, the question about regeneration. There's a question there about. How can we afford to do 69 High Street? Um, there was a there was a um, a phrase in there uh, that I've got a little bit of sympathy for. This is this a hammer to crack a nut, um, uh, and and all of that um, I'm afraid uh, falls into um, the world of local uh, authority, local government finance, where uh, some of the things uh, that we have to do and some of the reasons why we can and can't do stuff are set by rules uh, are, are set under are under rules and regulations that we don't set ourselves but we have to follow um and the most the most important one of those is the notion that um we cannot use capital to fund revenue expenditure so if if we have money uh whether it's ours or whether we borrow it we can't use it to fund revenue expenditure and that includes uh, repairs um so uh, in answer to the question um uh, why can't we use the money that we would spend to build these uh, uh, to build these homes just on repairing um, uh, the barriers? Uh, that's something we're not simply not allowed to do. And the reason we're not allowed to do it um, is because um, uh, because of financial sustainability in principle. I'm not going to pre pretend I agree with all of the rules and regulations, and I won't try and defend them. But the principle here um, is that um, if we um, if we spend um, three million pounds of capital uh, repairing um, the berries, um, we would lose that capital. Uh, and in 10 years time, nine, eight, seven, six, five years time, you know, we, we would um, still be back where we are today. So, um, so we have, we have that question of sustainability. So we have to consider options where uh, we can use our capital to invest in something um, that will, um, uh, that will, uh, if not generate us revenue benefits, at least um, uh, help us stem the recurring costs, the the recurring costs, the avoidable recurring costs, uh, which um, are just draining our our lifeblood, which should be going towards um, uh, our services rather than up in smoke out of the roof of this building. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, oh, 69 High Street, I beg your pardon. Um, so 69 High Street is a very good example of that. Um, 69 High Street uh, is a capital spend. So we, we have the capital um, to, to, to invest in that. We don't have the revenue funds, but we have the capital funds. But with 69 High Street, um, uh, we, will, uh, we will build homes there that will generate recurring annual revenue streams uh, that we can then... Um, uh, used to maintain the premises itself uh, and um, uh, hopefully fund our services on top of that. I hope that makes sense. Back to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm actually going to hand over to Liv, if you're still on the line. Yes, um, um, I was just going to come in on the, on the question about why this is viewed as a regeneration project. Um, if you look at the, these three sites, um, they, they really kind of triangulate different areas in Godalming. Um, you have the the um, the offices on Bridge Street, which sort of take take an anchor position at the end of um, the high street, um, and then you have the um, God the Crown Court car park, which is obviously right in the centre of the car park, a very strategic location, and then you have Wharf Road, which is actually over the other side of the main road, where there are significant connectivity issues, where there are people that who do struggle to find their way safely into into the town centre itself. Um, and, and between these three areas, there are different challenges for, for the town centre to start to address. And we're not saying that we can solve all of them uh, within these three sites, um, but these three sites actually have the opportunity to really address some of the issues that Godalming Town Centre is seeing at the moment. So in many ways, it, it is a great regeneration project because it is start, starting to try and address the various issues across the town centre. It's not simply focusing on the high street. It is focusing on, on the various uh, challenges throughout. And, and we really are aiming to, to utilise these sites, these council-owned sites, 
um, to, to kickstart a process of regeneration that will hopefully be picked up by other other developments and other shop frontages and and everything else uh, sort of throughout the throughout the town centre. Thank you, Olivia. I'm just going to pass back to Mark for a sec. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Olivia. Um, it, listen, we don't own the high street, um, and uh, we don't uh, we can't control what happens uh, in the high street. Uh, but what we can do is do our bit as best we can uh, to support it, um, particularly when it's going through uh, a period of, um, of of profound change. And that's not just the daytime high street, but the nighttime economy and other things as well. So, so the regeneration here is, you know, isn't us trying to to um, uh, to be all things to all people. It's us, you know, just trying to do our bit um, uh, as part and parcel of uh, what we have to do, or what we think we have to do, or something that we have to do um, to um, uh, to the Berry's office building to make it. Um, to make the best of uh, what you know, what is a, a, a tough, um, uh, uh, a tough situation. Um, we also, from a uh, from a financial standpoint, to come back to the financial rules and regulations that we face, um, are in a, are in a position where we are not allowed to do things like this just for money. Um, uh, even if we uh, even if we uh, didn't want to, we would have to uh, factor in other things like housing and other. Uh, um, objectives that we have, um, we do we embrace that and we do that willingly. Um, but the um, uh, part of the uh, thought process of of calling it the regeneration project was to flag uh, that um, you know we're not just doing something for ourselves for the money. I hope that makes sense. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to address uh, two two different types of questions uh, that have come up as well. And um, before, and I promise, Kathy Smythe, I will deal with your batch of questions at the end. I haven't missed any of them. I've got them all here. Um, so, one question I just want to address is is phasing. Um, I've had this come up a couple of times, and, and somebody's just alluded to it in the in the chat as well. Um, we would obviously not do anything on Crown Court until we had built the decked car park. So what we wouldn't want to do is create even a temporary crunch in car parking um, in the town. Um, so we would obviously do that first so that obviously for a brief period, we would actually have a, a, a large increase in car parking spaces before we actually did anything on Crown Court. But we would not cause a, a big uh, crunch. Um, in terms of spaces. Um, what I would say, though, is that when we've had uh, film crews, for example, that we've allowed to use Crown Court, um, th there has been some disruption, but there's not been a, a whole scale issue in the town centre in terms of parking when you look at the data. And um, so even if it did take it away, it, it wouldn't cause the whole town centre to shut down. We've seen what happens when when large sections are shut off. Um, but obviously, we wouldn't do um, anything that would last several months uh, in that way. We wouldn't we wouldn't do that. So we would build the deck car park first. Um, another question that came up earlier and has been alluded to as well here is, well, why are we doing this in Gothenburg? I mean, what, why, why aren't we even looking at the rest of Waverley? What other things are we doing? Um, and I think that there's a couple of ways we need to answer this. Firstly, we can only consider land that Waverley own um, because obviously we're not so flushed with money that we can just go and buy at market rate um, land and buildings off other people. Um, if we were in that kind of position, we probably wouldn't need to be looking at any of this uh, as a start, even as a start. Um, and the other th part of this is we do own land um, in other parts of Waverley, and we are looking at doing things with them. Some of them are regen projects a bit like this, and others are mixed use schemes. So, um, for example, the fairground site that we're looking at in Hazemere, the fairground car park site, is a similar sort of mixed use proposal um, on land that we own in Hazelmere. Um, and there's been other schemes in Farnham. Um, I, I, I dreaded to mention the word Brightwells, which is a scheme that, that really started before many of um, my, either myself or my colleagues were here. But it is there are other schemes throughout Waverley that, that have been considered in the past um, and are being worked up now that, that have similar aims and objectives to this. Um, and then finally, there's a, a batch of questions from Cathy Smythe, um, all of which are good, and I'm going to try and cover as many of them as possible. And Cathy, if there are ones I can't answer now, we will definitely get to them um, in the FAQs. 
Um, you asked a question about the history of the Crown Court site. Um, it's my understanding, and you'll forgive me because I'm only 36 years old and didn't see this myself. My understanding is that there was housing on the Crown Court as recently as the 60s. For, yeah. for decades. I yeah, think. certainly. Um, and I've asked the museum in Godalming if anybody's got any photos of this, because um, quite honestly, I'd like to see what it looked like. And, and uh, if there are any residents on here who have any photos of uh, the Crown Court when it previously had housing on it, we would absolutely love to see them and share them. Um, but in the past, it did. Um, and uh, we will write more fully in the FAQ about what sort of things it had and what the density of that housing was. Um, there was also a question you had appended to that about how it came into the council's ownership. And, and honestly, I don't know that off the top of my head. And um, we will we will ask um, our assets and property team if they can uh, explain in the FAQs as to how we came into ownership of it in the first place. I'm sure knowing Godalming's, uh, some of Godalming's history, it will be a particularly exotic and random occurrence. And I would bet any money you like, Godalming Borough probably got it at some point and it became part of Waverley when Waverley was created in the 70s. Um, some of your other questions about how we're going to heat the site, um, as I don't, I definitely don't need to explain to you some of the technology in terms of heating, so ground source and air source heat pumps, certainly when we get into availability and scale of those sorts of things are still relatively in their infancy, but we're committed to exploring um, both new and emergent heating technologies in order to get this done um, in a sustainable way. Certainly, we want to make sure that there is a, a reasonable solar um, element to this building. So it's actually contributing um, to a sustainable energy um, component itself. I'm just going to quickly go through to make sure I haven't missed anybody else's um, questions. You also asked, Cathy, about the, stru the physical structure, the steel structure of the building. Um, we will allude to that in the FAQs as uh, the, the group we've got here. Definitely not structural engineers. Mark, did you want to just pick up on a bit of that? He's not a structural engineer, by the way, but sure. I'm sure he'll give it a <laughs> no, but, uh, but, 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 in, but in actual fact, um, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the notion at the moment is, in fact, that, that it's actually the, um, I think it's concrete and, and steel uh, yeah. structure is probably okay, which is why we can get away with uh, refurbishing the uh, um, the building beyond that skeleton, rather than having to knock the whole thing down. Knocking the whole thing down at uh, uh, a uh, is is a whole different order of expenditure, and b is um, uh, environmentally extremely harmful. So uh, we're looking at uh, we're looking at all of those options. I've just got uh, I've just got a couple of other things I want to pick up from late questions that popped in. Um, uh, uh, Timothy, you said the high street needs car parking. Well, um, so does the council. Um, you know, the revenue from car parking is, is um, extremely important to us uh, uh, as an independent source of revenue. Um, and um, we can't spend it on everything. That There are only certain things we're allowed to spend it on. Uh, but it is uh, an important thing for us, which is why car parking, uh, the retention of car parking is as precious to us as it is um, uh, to others, maybe for different reasons. Um, Daniel, um, you said you've heard that we'll be seeking approval of spending for, of over a million for phase three. Um, I don't know um, where you've heard that from. Uh, I am afraid that this project has attracted a certain amount of disinformation. Um, uh, 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 we, we haven't sought approval for spending of over a million for phase three. We have received approval for spending £164,000 on this phase three. This uh, um, uh, engagement is the start of that process. We've only spent about £6,000 of it so far. Um, and that budget is for um, all of the due diligence and all of the homework uh, that you would expect a responsible council to undertake in, uh, in, in drilling down and assessing all of the various details that need to be uh, addressed. Um, that's uh, it for now. Um, yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I'm going to answer one last question before I hand over to Dawn to um, tell people about next steps and what further engagement is coming. Um, this came up with the Chamber of Commerce as well, and it was about why we aren't able to put loads of houses on the council office site. Um, and that's because of the way the flood zone intersects the site. And um, uh, the, the immediate comment that comes up whenever I say that is, well, we'll look over the road at the Magna Homes development. Of course, that was built in a flood zone. Um, and I think I'd be fair to say that I don't think personally it's appropriate building in the flood zone when we know it might flood, whether we legally can or not. 
But of course, what's changed in terms of national planning policy is that that went from guidance as to whether you should or you shouldn't to it being legally prohibited. And so we now can't. Um, Waverley being the planning authority absolutely have to be within the complete letter of the law when we're doing projects of our own. Um, so it's absolutely impossible for us to put forward projects that we know would be illegal. Um, but I just want to reassure residents that there's a reason why we aren't proposing to build houses and that, if, and, and that the rules have changed since developments like the Magna Homes one over the road. I'm now going to hand over to Dawn to talk about next steps um, and further engagement. Thank you, Paul. Um, well, what great engagement tonight. We've had over 60 questions come in on the Q&A, and we've tried to answer as many as possible that we, we can tonight. We will, um, as I said at the beginning, put uh, a lot of information on our FAQs um, so that you can uh, see uh, what the questions were. Uh, we've also recorded tonight's um, event, um, so that can be viewed um, outside of this presentation. Um, so that will go on the website. Um, and the webinar is on YouTube, um, which um, so you can share that with people uh, who haven't been able to make it tonight. This is the start of the consultation. It's the first round that we're doing on this project. Um, there is a, another event this Saturday at the old m &Co building, 69 The High Street um, from 9.30 till 11.30. Paul mentioned that earlier. Um, and this period of engagement will end at the end of October, but I will stress again, it is only the first stage of engagement for this project. Um, and we will, of course, take on board and consolidate uh, what we've heard from you tonight. There's some, been some really good questions, I think there's been some food for thought, um, and definitely some really positive comments, which is always really good uh, to hear um, from our residents and interested parties. So that's it from us tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, sorry we've overrun a little bit, but that was because we had so many questions and I think it was worthwhile staying a little bit later to get those answered. So thank you, everybody, and good night.